It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Carla, Andrew, and the other guys for uh, making the big effort to make this event possible. I suppose it's one of the few um, proper conferences that we get to attend this year. Um, so I want to speak about two color methods in strong field physics. Um, this is mainly about work that has been done by the two PhD students, Sheng Chun Yue and Nicolas Eike in my group. You can see them on this picture. Jun is the guy in the back left with the victory sign and Nicolas is here. If I have enough time, I might also say a little bit about non-dipole effects calculated by Simon here. Okay, but before I go into that, I will first show you, because these are the quantum battles, I first show you the weapon that I brought. Uh, this snake here uh, is a very interesting one. Some people call it a flying snake. And it can actually fly using two color waveforms, using very much the stuff that I discuss here. Actually, one, one minor detail here is the snake has some interesting fast cars uh, put up in his cage. Maybe the chairman can recognize what that is. Uh, but let's come back to the snake. If you don't believe that this snake can fly or let's say glide through air at least, please go to this uh, YouTube link uh, to view the flying snake in action. And there has actually been a nature physics paper published very recently, just last week, where um, some medical engine, biomedical engineers have done measurements on this flying snake. And um, so what they find is that this snake does some kind of undulation motion while it glides through air. So here in panel B, you see a top view of the snake. And what they have found out is that there are two kinds of waves. One wave um, is such that the snake makes displacements in the horizontal direction at a certain frequency. That's the blue curve. And the other wave is displacements in the vertical direction at two omega, twice the frequency. And they even find out there is a well-defined phase relation between the two waves of 90 degree relative phase. And, and they, uh, they argue that the purpose of this kind of two color waveform is to keep the snake stable as it glides through air. Okay, so that I think is a, is a very nice example of a two color waveform. Of course, our setting is a bit different. We look at atoms and molecules in the gas phase ionized by strong femtosecond laser pulses. And the central question that I want to ask throughout the talk is, how can we define and observe the time of ionization? So to make it clear uh, at once, I am not talking at all about times needed for a particle to go through a tunneling barrier. When I speak of the time of ionization, what I really mean is the time of departure of the electron. And I will show you two methods how we can uh, see these times. Uh, one is based on high harmonic generation and the other one is based on an auto clock type scheme. Uh, this is a brief list of previous work using omega two omega fields for um, measurement of ionization time. Uh, probably the list is not complete. I think there has been some work also done by the Imperial College group. Also Katerina Wotzi yesterday showed us uh, interesting new results from her on this topic. Um, so Basically, it's important to realize that there are these two possibilities. We can have the two polarization directions of the omega and two omega field either orthogonal to each other or parallel to each other. And I will address both cases in this talk. So let me first remind all of you about the three-step model of high harmonic generation. I think almost everybody is familiar with it. Uh, in the three-step model, we uh, think of the atom first being ionized by the presence of the strong field. In the second step, we have an unbound electron that is accelerated away and back to the parent ion. In the third step, the electron recombines with the parent ion and emits a photon. And this, uh, this gives rise to the typical shape of the observed emission spectrum from such a system that shows a cutoff at a certain harmonic order that is uh, simply related to the maximum return, kinetic return energy of the electron. 
The quantum mechanical version of this is also well known to many of you. We call it the strong field approximation or the quantum orbit model. Wilhelm has, uh, has explained a lot about quantum orbits already in his talk. So the point here is in contrast to the classical model, times become complex. So in these equations, the Ti and the Tr are the complex time of ionization where the electron starts and the time of recombination when the electron goes back into the initial bound state. And these are the three saddle point equations that you need to solve to find these two complex times. Okay, um, now the question is, can we actually set up a scheme to measure these times? Uh, and the answer is yes. Already many years ago, uh, Dudovich and co-workers uh, introduced this two color scheme where we have um, higher mind generation by a fundamental field with a strong fundamental with frequency omega and a weak two omega field polarized in the perpendicular direction. So this, this additional field somehow uh, probes the electron motion. It moves the electron trajectory sideways in such a way that the electron might miss the parent ion when it comes back. So only for a certain um, suitable two color delay, that's the relative phase between the two colors, uh, will you have the situation that the electron can come back nicely and there you have a high harmonic yield. That's what they have called the displacement gate. There's also another gate, the velocity gate. And that is to say that the, also the relative, also the return angle of the electron depends on the relative phase of the two colors. And if you think about that in a bit more detail, you actually find that this determines the ratio of even to odd harmonics. And that's another observable, that's a second observable you can measure. And that's how then the experimental result really looks like. In the upper um, part, you have the measurement of the two observables. So a vertical axis is harmonic order. Horizontal axis is the relative delay between omega and two omega. And the color in the left panel shows you the harmonic strength of the signal. And the color in the right panel shows you the ratio of even to odd harmonics. If you use these two observable, observables to reconstruct ionization and return time, you find the results in the bottom panel and the red dots are the experimental uh, results. And they are compared here with the gray line, which is the classical simple man's model. And you see it does not really fit well to that. <clears throat> but the experimental measurement matches very well the black line, which is the quantum orbit, the SFA times from the saddle point equations. So since we will be using this uh, scheme later on, I think it's good to look once at the equations that you need to solve. Um, so as I said, you have these two gates and for each of these two gates, you have an equation. So the first gate is the displacement gate. Um, and, and what really happens is that um, if you want the electron to return to the parent ion in the presence of the two color field, then because it's a curved trajectory, you will need a certain initial transverse velocity. Um, sorry, um, initial transverse velocity to make it return. And just from classical arguments, you find this equation here, which depends on Ti, Tr, and the relative phase phi. And you expect that you get the maximum signal if the, the, this transverse velocity is zero, which happens for a certain choice of phase. And then there's the velocity gate, which tells you what is the angle of the returning electron. And uh, if you want to maximize that, you have to set the derivative of this classical expression to zero. And that gives you then two equations to retrieve the two times. But actually in our implementation, we find that it's better to use these equations with complex times. So Ti and Tr are now complex. Uh, which then actually means that it's really four equations. And if we have two observables and four equations, we need to make some extra assumptions, but that's not a big problem. We set the imaginary part of the return time to zero because we know it's small. And uh, one other assumption that we make is that we set the imaginary part of the ionization time to the Keldish time, which is a simple formula that we can just plug in. 
And if we do that, we can actually uh, go and reproduce the experiment. So what we have done already many years ago is solve the 2D or 3D um, numerical time-dependent Schrodinger equation for a helium atom with these parameters. And in the right, you see the, the traces for the harmonic signal and y to x amplitude ratio. It looks very much like in the experiment. And then we do this time retrieval, and then you find the result on the left. So again, harmonic order is plotted on the vertical axis and on and the horizontal axis is time. And we show here both ionization time and return time. You should look here at <clears throat> basically the purple points, which agree very well with the quantum orbit model, which is the thick gray line in the background. You can't see it because actually the TDSE result overlaps with the quantum orbit result. So um, two things. One thing is important. I, I should emphasize that the point here is that you can measure or determine um, ionization time and return time for every harmonic order separately. And now there is, uh, there is one striking result here. These retrieve times are amazingly close to the quantum orbit times. And I remember that um, probably five years ago when I gave a, a talk and I included this result, Dieter, <clears throat> who is our chairman now, actually asked me this question, why is this result so close to the quantum orbit model? Are there no Coulomb effects? Actually, at the time, I couldn't give a good answer, but I can give the answer now. So um, before I do that, I want to remind you why we actually would expect to see some shifts, some difference between these um, these results. And, and to that end, let's think about the auto clock. The auto clock has been introduced by, uh, by some other speakers already. Um, so there we observe photoelectrons from ionization in a strong field. And that's usually a near circularly polarized um, pulse so that your momentum distribution is um, um, like a torus. <clears throat> and then uh, we can determine the angle under which the maximum signal is observed. And that angle has to do something with the ionization time. And we know that there is a strong Coulomb effect on the outgoing electron that will modify this angle, as we see in this picture that I have stolen, like all the other speakers from the paper by Torlina et al. Um, <clears throat> so putting this the other way, it means that if you look at a fixed momentum, then for this given momentum, the ionization time is changed by the Coulomb potential. It's not the same as in the short range potential. So in the same way, we would expect that, we would expect that to happen for the harmonic generation. So, um, okay, the, the case, the, the question is, can we use something like the auto clock principle to learn something about the ionization time uh, in high harmonic generation? And that's of course difficult because the setting is different. We have circular polarization in one case, linear polarization in the other case. And um, uh, one could think about doing the auto clock with linear polarization, but it's just not possible because uh, in linear polarization, you have a lot of effects. You have intracycle, subcycle interference, you have rescattering, you have Kuhler focusing, holography, all that into one uh, distribution. So it's very complicated and it, you cannot analyze it uh, like, like an auto clock. Um, but there's a trick, we can use a bicircular field. So in particular, we can use a superposition of two counter rotating fields with frequency omega and two omega. Depending on the ratio of field strength, the total field shape will look uh, like one of these pictures. And we are particularly interested in this two to one ratio, because what does it do? It actually has, <clears throat> it features three times per optical cycle indicated by the red circles, where uh, the total field of this bicycular field mimics linear polarization. So if you look here, as we approach this endpoint here, um, the electric field basically moves on a line. So we can uh, actually use this bicycular field to learn something about the ionization mechanism in linearly polarized light. And that's what we do in the following. So this shows you some results of our calculations. On the left, you see um, then um, 
photoelectron momentum distribution created by such a two to one bicircular field. The left one is calculated using SFA with a CW field, and that's why <clears throat> the three blobs in this threefold structure are equally strong. In the right picture, you see the result from a TDSE calculation for a short pulse. And there we prefer one of these three lobes because of the short pulse length. And this is the one that we analyze in the following. The important finding here is that you see that when you project this um, distribution on the vertical axis, it's not symmetric, it's not up and down symmetric around zero, but there's an upshift here. And this is exactly analogous to the utter clock angle in the circular polarization. <clears throat> so we will analyze this utter clock shift in the following, but there is one, um, maybe now I should emphasize there is one limitation of this utter clock principle because of course it gives you only one ionization time. I mean, if you have a model in um, how that helps to analyze this result, what you basically do is you look at the location of the peak and you assign an ionization time to that peak. You cannot do a momentum resolved measurement of ionization time. In order to do that, you would have to do something additional and that's what we have also done. You could combine this, uh, this ionizing field with the weak probe field. That's what we now call the two color methods combined with the bicircular field. So for example, look at this picture here. In addition to the ionizing field in red, we apply this two omega streaking field uh, pointing perpendicular to the ionizing field. And here on the right is a picture for parallel polarization. <clears throat> so it's a little bit, um, <clears throat> it's a little bit complicated to think about the details of this scheme. So um, I just try to explain it in, in very few terms. What you have to do is have, you have to pick a momentum in the momentum plane. So you go somewhere and then you watch the strength of the photoelectron signal as a function of the relative phase between the ionizing field and the probe field. And from this optimal phase, where the, uh, the signal is maximized, you can calculate back to what the ionization time must have been. And, and that actually works with very simple equations here on the left and here on the right for the two different polarization cases. So um, this retrieval of the time is actually much simpler than in the higher harmonic generation case. And now let's see what, the, what is the result that we get <clears throat> for a helium atom um, ionized with this two to one bicircular field. So this is the basically the typical plot that you always see when you analyze the auto clock. You, uh, in the auto clock, you have on the vertical axis the auto clock angle, and on the right axis, the, on the horizontal axis, the laser intensity. So here in the upper, here the vertical axis is the relative upward shift that I showed you before, which is analogous to the auto clock angle. The black dots is, is the shift itself. So uh, as we, like we are used to from the outer clock, this uh, decays, it decreases a little bit with intensity. And the other two, the blue and the red dots, are the results from the two color probing method. And now we see something very interesting. If we use the orthogonal probing, the, where the two omega field is, is perpendicular to the ionizing field, uh, we see that it's basically useless. <clears throat> you see that it, um, or I, sh I should explain in a bit more detail was shown here, the red curve and the blue curve are those momenta that correspond to ionization at time zero. That means at the peak of the applied laser field. Um, so you see that the blue curve uh, does not agree at all with the outer clock shift. But in the red case where we do the parallel probing, we have very good agreement. So the agreement with, between the red and the black actually tells us that the maximum signal corresponds to ionization at the peak of the field. So this means that the orthogonal probing actually cannot measure the Coulomb shift of the ionization time, but the parallel can measure it. And now what is the reason for this? And this is now actually coming back to the problem in higher harmonic generation. Um, actually the time retrieval equations that we have used 
here and also in the higher month generation case, like they were developed by uh, Dudovich and Kovar, is they do not include the Coulomb field. So the assumption is basically that the probe, the motion due to the probe field shows no Coulomb effects. And that is, of course, maybe not quite correct. And uh, it's an approximation. And now what it turns out that actually, if you have omega two omega, then you have Coulomb effects both in the omega direction and in the two omega directions. And these just cancel each other in such a way that the atom essentially behaves as if it had a short range potential. This does not happen in the parallel case. Um, okay, now um, I will make this here very brief. We have applied this uh, bicircular outer clock also to molecules and we found something interesting there. Uh, so we did it for a, a simple helium H plus molecule that is either aligned along the ionizing field or in the opposite direction, two different cases. And um, the interesting thing is that we do see an outer clock shift, of course, as with an atom. And this outer clock shift is orientation dependent. It depends on how, the, how we place the molecule, but the ionization time is not orientation dependent. No matter whether the um, uh, molecule points up or down, ionization is always most st uh, strong when the, at the time of the peak field strength. I will also not go uh, into much detail about the non-dipole effects. I just want to mention uh, maybe one thing um, here. <clears throat> this is something that we have also published in connection with the bicircular auto clock. Um, you could actually use, instead of the two omega field polarized perpendicular to the ionizing field, you could instead it, exploit the Lorentz force on the outgoing electron due to the magnetic field, because that Lorentz force also is in the perpendicular direction. It's actually in the propagation direction of your laser field. So um, you, could, you could think of replacing the two omega probe by that Lorentz force. Um, and we have analyzed that and we, we found that actually this kind of utter clock also does not give you the true ionization time. It, it also kind of measures the Coulomb free time. So um, what that really means is if, if you look at the result that whereas your distribution shows an utter clock shift as we see in the top here, um, the position where your forward, forward non-dipole shift that comes from the radiation pressure is minimal, always remains in the center of this distribution. It does not, it does not follow the outer clock shift. Okay, but um, let me um, come back in the final few minutes to the uh, high harmonic generation case. So the question is, can we make it, uh, can we make this orthogonal probing work nevertheless? So we found something interesting there. We actually repeated this probing, not using two omega fields, but other streaking frequencies. So here you see results where we always ionize or where we always generate harmonics with the same fundamental frequency, which is 800 nanometers in this case. But the probe field, which is in the perpendicular uh, direction, is varied from 1.4 omega to 4.6 omega. And the interesting finding is that if you look at this result plot where we have harmonic order on the vertical axis, ionization time on the horizontal, we see that all the low, freq all the low frequency streaking frequencies um, give rise to the results in the right on in the right part here whereas all the high frequencies give results in the left part so there's an obvious difference between high frequency and low frequency probe fields or streaking fields and now i think it's it's time to really um, look at the question um, how do we actually expect the cooler potential to affect this ionization time so um, we have the quantum orbit times from SFA, and the question is how are they changed by the presence of the Coulomb, Coulomb potential? <clears throat> I show you three different ways to address this problem. One is, is probably well known to many of you. It's called the analytical R matrix theory developed by Olga Smirnova and her co-workers. There you correct 
the SFA action by adding uh, a Coulomb term, which is essentially the time integral of the Coulomb potential. And then what you can do is you can find the, the corrected saddle point times by calculating the new saddle points. Um, I'll show you the results in a minute. An alternative model that we have set up is a classical model. We call it here a modified classical model. It uses Newtonian trajectories in the presence of the Coulomb potential and the external field. Um, it uses a little bit of SFA input for the starting conditions and we use zero transverse velocity. And, and from that we can and then derive numerically a new relation between the ionization time and the harmonic order. And the last one is, is the simplest one. And um, let me explain that briefly. Um, in the, in the other clock, or in general, if you ionize with the low frequency field, there's actually a very simple way to estimate the uh, Coulomb effect on the outgoing electron. In the adiabatic limit, so for a slowly varying field, uh, Nikolai shvetsov shilovsky has actually derived many years ago this simple formula. That's the momentum kick on the escaping electron in the presence of the Coulomb field. Uh, it, it's proportional to the electric I think I got thrown out exactly at this point. Um, so now you can hear me and see me and, and see the screen? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, okay, I will do it quickly. Um, so I showed you these three models to, uh, to model the Coulomb shift of the ionization time in high harmonic generation. And um, as we see, here, this is the result of the three models. They are very similar to each other um, and they differ from the quantum orbit time, which is the gray line, and also very much from the simple man's model, which is the dashed line. Um, okay, and now let's see how uh, the retrieve times look that we get from the tedious E2 color uh, scheme. So uh, on the vertical axis now we have the ionization time and I plot here the results for four different harmonic orders, 42, 47, 50, 53, and the black dot dash is the quantum orbit times without Coulomb and then red and uh, violet are the models for the Coulomb shifted ionization time. And this is the result from the two color harmonic generation at various frequencies and so you see there's a, a very interesting double plateau structure. At low frequency, um, this scheme yields the Coulomb free time. At high frequency, it uh, yields something that is actually quite close to the, to the models for the Coulomb shifted time. So um, the finding is that, um, or the explanation is that at low frequency, we somehow uh, have the problem that uh, we cannot neglect the Coulomb effect in this time retrieval equations and therefore we, uh, in, when we do it nevertheless, we measure the Coulomb free time and in the high frequency um, the scheme is adequate so we measure the correct ionization time. So a, a proposal for an experiment would be for example uh, do the measurement for omega 2 omega and another one for omega 4 omega, look at the difference and that should give you the Coulomb shift of the ionization time. Okay and that was my conclusions slide. Um, I showed you in the beginning the two to one bicircular Auto clock. Uh, I hope I could convince you that it's a very interesting and, and nice tool to measure uh, aspects of ionization with maybe higher accuracy as the other fields that we are used to. And then in the second part, I showed you the in the, in the last part, I showed you results from this two-color orthogonal high harmonic generation, where we see this interesting difference between low frequency probing and high frequency probing. And hoping that I was not cut off this time, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Manfred. You were not cut off. So are there questions to Manfred? I don't see raised hands. So I have one question. You had uh, this plot with the ionization times and then high frequency and low frequency and they came in groups. So why is this transition not continuous from high to low frequency? Well, you, uh, okay, I think you are referring to this plot. 
Is that right? I, I cannot see anymore because you don't share the screen. Okay, I'm sorry. I will do it quickly. Now you should see it. Yes. Okay, the, I think this is the plot you are referring to. Yes. It, it looks as if there is no transition, but uh, if you look at the last plot that I showed just now, this is basically the same thing, just plotted in a different way. So here we really, we, we do it for many, many different streaking frequencies and we see that there is a continuous transition. Um, but there is a kind of double plateau structure. So in the, what I've shown you in the other plot uh, were points that were either in the low frequency plateau or in the high frequency plateau that you see here. Okay. Good. So are there other questions? I don't see raised hands or questions in the Q&A box. So then I would like to thank all speakers and the organizers for assisting me. Are there announcements by the organizers? Seems not the case. So then I would like to thank you all and then I close this session. Bye.